A very good afternoon and welcome to today's session on BIC streams, Magpie Murders to Moonflower Murders, Anthony Horowitz in conversation with Paro Anand. Uh, this is the first session as part of our World Lit series that we are doing in collaboration with the Bangalore Literature Festival. Thank you so much for doing this for us, uh, BLF. Uh, before I hand it over to Sri Krishna from the Bangalore Literature Festival, a few quick instructions. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time or are not on our mailing list, do sign up or follow us on our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you can read the bios of today's panelists on the chat box that you will see at the bottom of your screen. Next to the chat box is the Q&A section. You can type in your questions in the Q&A box. For those of you who are watching this session on YouTube, you can type in your questions in the comment section and we will ensure that uh, it's asked in the room here. With that, uh, thank you again, Sri Krishna and the Bangalore Literature Festival. And thank you panelists for joining us today and audiences, uh, over to you Sri Krishna. Thanks, Raghu. Welcome, Anthony. Welcome, Paro. Uh, delighted that uh, you're doing this uh, for us. Uh, we're, we've, we, the Bangalore Literature Festival started in 2012, and uh, since then, we've pretty much been a festival that popped up once a year. Uh, while we kept thinking through these eight or nine years as to you know, what else is it that we could be doing uh, through the year, uh, I'd say just really a uh, lot of enthusiasm, but perhaps not as much uh, uh, bandwidth and action to be able to pull something off. And then uh, came along a situation that we are in now, and we said, uh, this is probably the best time uh, more than ever to uh, really launch a, a digital literary platform, uh, which really is uh, what World Lit is. And uh, we're absolutely delighted, uh, Anthony and Paro, that uh, you could be here with us uh, uh, at this inaugural uh, edition of uh, World Lit. Um, uh, as the bios go up uh, about both Anthony and Paro, maybe just a line each, uh, word on the street about Anthony is that uh, he might have committed uh, more fictional murders uh, than any other living author. Uh, Paro, of course, peerless writer, has been a friend of uh, the Bangalore Literature Festival for a while now, uh, has participated in our editions in the past, uh, prolific author uh, for young adults, and uh, also the winner of the uh, Saitya Academy Bal Puraskar uh, not too long ago, and used to also head the National Book Trust, which is India's uh, apex body for uh, children's literature. Uh, with that, I'll uh, ask Paro to uh, take over from here. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much to the Bangalore International Center and for the uh, Bangalore Literature Festival for putting this together and inviting the world to come in uh, to meet us. Great to meet you, Anthony. Uh, yet again, I so enjoyed. It's been one of the highlights <laughs> of my life to have met you then. And uh, so great to have you here um, in these very strange times to be able to meet again. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time in um, any introduction or anything, because if we do that, I discovered last time, then half the time would go into talking about all that you do. So first of all, while researching for this interview, uh, I discovered that you and I have a lot in common, um, including the very interesting fact that uh, our favorite pie is lemon meringue pie. <laughs> <laughs> what a place to start, Haro, really. Lemon meringue so, pie. <laughs> so we have a lot in common, but there's one essential difference. My books don't sell in the millions. In the well. millions. Before you go on, Para, let me just say two things myself. First of all, I want to also thank the Bangalore International Festival for bringing us together. It is so important, particularly at this moment, that books and literature and reading should have their place, that we should be able to come together, even if it's only on a screen. And secondly, I just want to say on a personal level, but it's absolutely lovely to be talking with you. We got on like a house on fire when we first met. I think it's true to say that we're friends. You also know I'm a great admirer of your work. I can't imagine anybody I'd be happier talking to on this slightly damp Saturday morning here in England than you. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anthony. 
Um, and we'll, we, at some point in life, we will share that lemon meringue pie. We will be together again and we will be eating lemon meringue pie rather than looking at it electronically over a screen, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, on the eve of your new book, I just wanted to first say a huge thank you for writing that recommendation line for my book, The Other. I'm going to oh, yeah. flash it here. And where Anthony uh, gave a very beautiful uh, recommendation line. Uh, so in this very strange time, Anthony, uh, how is COVID treating you? Uh, how is the lockdown treating you personally and also as a writer? Well, first of all, personally, I'm very fortunate that my family has been well, and I'm actually living in lockdown with my family. Uh, mm. We have a slightly odd arrangement because I live in a sort of three flats, and the two flats under me belong to my son. So it's one building. So I can see both my older son, my younger son, girlfriends, their girlfriends, not mine, I hasten to add, uh, and other friends who are in the building. And we have barbecues on the roof, and it's all quite, mm. it's quite pleasant. And I have to say that one of the strange things is, is that, Although obviously this is a terrible thing that has happened to the world and I fear gravely for the consequences of the future, I think it is also true that there have been some wonderfully happy times during it. I myself am less stressed, less depressed than I have been for a long time. And I think that it's a learning curve of how much there was in my life that I did not need. I think that's true also of, of the world actually in a way that when you are in London and you look out and you can see unpolluted sky for the first time, when the River Thames, the water is clean, when you can breathe air but doesn't make your throat hurt, you know, you suddenly realise that actually there is a better world within our grasp when we come through this if we're ready to take it. On a professional level, I've been very busy, I've been writing every single day um, and People think that it should be no different. I've been in self-isolation as a writer for, for 35 years, but it is different because writers, and you'll know this, Paro, we draw on the outside world. We draw on life. We draw on vitality. Writers, in a way, are vampires. We suck in the energy of those around us. And when the streets are empty and when there is no energy there, everything becomes a little bit more difficult or a little more peculiar. It's not the same. And um, I have to say that, Whilst on the one hand, I hope that we learn the lessons from what is good out of all this. And on the other hand, I can't wait until things get back a little bit more to normal. Thank you. Um, this space where you're sitting, is this where you sit, right? I'm this is actually the spare bedroom. And what I'm sitting on is, a, what I'm sitting on, these rather weird trees you can see behind me, are actually a bed. <laughs> oh. On the bed. Uh, because my <laughs> wife is in the other, my wife is in the main room. She's doing another Zoom call for for a theatre that she's involved with, and um, so she sent me in here today. <laughs> wow! So that that that's the stuff of different dreams to have these. It's, these Miss Ben, I tell you, if you sleep in this bed, you have very strange dreams. It's one of the weird, yeah, one of the sure. one of the weird things about it. <laughs> I'm sure. So. Has the landscape of your day as a writer changed? Where, this it's a, uh, what an interesting question. I think, look, I work about 10 hours every day anyway. Um, I'm, I'm, I sit in a, a room at my office upstairs and, uh, and I work there. Um, what has changed is that everything seems to take longer. Before, my work was very bursts of energy and, and a hard focus. Um, now, because there is nothing else really in the world to do except for the, you know, walking the dog and things like that, mm. the work seems to sort of stretch itself out. So, so yeah. what would have taken me an hour takes me now 10 hours. Uh, but at the same time, the quality of my work has been good, I think. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with the fact, I've been writing, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I have a new children's book, which you can read online it's on my website, anthonyhorowitz.com. It's free of charge. It's, a, it's, it's my gift to young people who are in lockdown. And it's a comedy novel. It's a Diamond Brothers. The, the story is called um, Where Seagulls Dare. So it's Where Eagles Dare, but it's Where Seagulls Dare, which these books are all sort of jokes on films. And what's interesting to me is that even with all the worries around me and even in this vacuum, the jokes have been coming. I'm writing good jokes. Mm. So I'm very happy uh, with, with the quality of my work. and and. And I have achieved a lot. I'm kind of relieved to hear that it's taken, taking everything seems to be stretched out. Because just this morning I was sitting with a book and I'm thinking, why is it taking me so long? 
uh, to write even half a chapter. I'm, I have the additional privilege as well as challenge or pressure. I'm on a fellowship. I'm on a writer's fellowship where I'm being paid to stay home and write, which is, you know, any writer's dream. And yet somehow I'm, you know, it's, yeah, that kind of stretched out feeling that it's a little bit like um, sort of wading through water kind of feeling. Yeah, it's a funny thing. There's another paradox to all this as well, which is that the day, even though everything is stretched out and slower, the day disappears in the blink of an eye. You suddenly look at your watch and it's sort of, it's eight o'clock in the evening. How, how did I get here? What, you know, yes. what's happened to the day? But, you know, it's, it's, it is a, such an, un, you know, London, to walk through London right now, it's like walking in a science fiction novel because, you know, a zombie novel or something, because even though the lockdown is beginning to ease up now and things are returning to normal, for weeks, the streets have been completely empty. And another side of this is, is that I will walk five minutes from my home, which is in Clark or whatever, center of town, and I will notice buildings that I must have walked past a hundred times, but have never seen before. And that's because in normal life, you're always looking at the people in front of you and around you, the traffic, obviously, and you're in a hurry to get somewhere. So you're not really walking, you're just on your way somewhere. Yeah. But now I can look at the architecture, I can say, wow, that building is beautiful. Why haven't I seen it? When did they build it? And, and of course, it's been there for 500 years. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's really um, fun to know. And it's, I mean, in, in this, you, you're a very energetic writer. And I can see that you also feed off the energy of the people around you. I saw a wonderful interview that you did with uh, school children in an auditorium, and then there were lots, 500 schools of, uh, online as well. Uh, so, but what keeps you going in this, uh, well, not really in this time, but and all, are you missing the travel? Are you missing the face to face? I'm not, there's a lot I'm not missing. I'm not really missing the travel. I mean, obviously, I would have loved to have been sitting in a room with you right now, but Travel is, you know, it's, it's travel is exhausting and it's, it's, it's against the environment. And, you know, I think that we do have to start questioning these things. Will there ever be literary festivals again? When? I mean, I love literary festivals. I love coming together. I love seeing strange faces. I love meeting people. But, you know, one has to wonder how this will change us for the future. So have I missed travel? Have I missed restaurants? Have I missed theatres? Yes and no is the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is because I've gained things. I've gained time with my family. I've gained time to enjoy meals. In the morning now, when I wake up, instead of rushing up to my office, I read for an hour. And I've forgotten the pleasure of lying in bed with a book and starting the day with, you know, with, a, with some fiction and, and such. And so I'm listening to, you know, in the bath, I listen to classical music instead of listening to the news. It's little changes to my perception to my life and they're all to do with books and, and, and arts and such that, that, are, that, that are largely beneficial. As I say, one has to look, I think, to the silver linings. You know, we have, we, I hope we're not going to talk about America and what's happening over there, because there is a sense that the world is collapsing around me, and, and I have to try and fight against that. And, and my answer to that is in conversations with the likes with like that we're having now, in books, in my writing, in my work, in the, in the things that make life worth living. Nice. Yeah, I, so coming to your, your kind of writing, uh, you write basically murder mysteries. And by the way, I've written a murder mystery myself. Uh, where a group of it. women writers were, <laughs> they, we published a book called She Stoops to Kill. And Very good. Women committing murder. Uh, <laughs> and mine came out of a moment when I'd had a big, row with my husband and I had Did gone, you kill him? Huh? Did you kill him? <laughs> well, I went for a long walk, which is <laughs> how I work out a day. And by the time I had finished walking nine kilometers, I was desperate for coffee. I sat down with uh, coffee and my notebook and wrote about a woman who wants to kill her husband. Uh, that, that, that's the, he's still alive and well. <laughs> very, I'm glad, it's better to write about it than to do it. It's one of the things that interests me, which is, it's a very interesting question of why 
real murder yeah. is so disgusting and horrible and yeah. shocking. I mean, mm -hmm. if anybody saw a dead body in a room, they would be repulsed and, and would, would feel sick and afraid. Mm -hmm. And yet when you put them into books and you write about murdering your husband or you write violent death, it becomes entertainment. I'm always interested in that, in what yeah. happens to murder as it travels from reality into fiction. Uh, and why it is that murder mystery is one of the most popular genres on the planet. We are obsessed by murder, but at the same time, the reality of it, the sort of, you know, the violence in America that we're seeing now is just shocking and horrible. Yeah. Always interests me. So do you have an answer? Have you found some, where do you put the I talk about it a lot in my books. I write about it. I, I think there are many, many answers to it. I mean, I think that the joy of writing murder mystery for me is that it is the fastest way to connect two people in a way that is uniquely interesting. If I murder you, and indeed I have got an idea for a murder that takes place over Zoom, but that's for another day. Um, <laughs> why have I done it? What are the reasons why I would kill you or you would kill me? And as soon as you start asking that question, you are asking questions about our relationship. You're not asking questions about violence and death. The murder in a murder mystery is just an excuse to explore character. But at the same time, because murder, you don't murder somebody because you're a little bit upset with them or a little bit angry with them. You do it because your emotions are very big and you are, you are in an extreme place. So you're talking about extreme emotions, which is also interesting. You know, it, it's powerful and it's bigger than life. So I think those are some of the reasons why. But also, I've, I've said this before, I think, in my books, that a murder mystery, at the end of the day, is a pursuit of truth. The murder mystery book is the one book where you get to the last page and everything is explained. A whodunit without an ending is like a chocolate teapot. It is completely useless. Um, so, so... When you read a murder mystery, you know you are heading to complete truth. And in a world in which nothing is certain anymore, where fake news is in all around us, where you don't know if you can trust anything you hear, I think there is enormous solace in coming to a book that mm. gives you all the answers. Mm. Which uh, skips me over many questions, which I have them in a very orderly fashion. But because you brought this up, you do have in Magpie Murders uh, the missing last chapter. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, that's exactly right. So the, just, the, just, the, the, the know, as you said, it's, it's, a, the, it's the, the feeling of a chocolate tea uh, teacup. It's, it's useless. And yet, there is in Magpie Murders this the missing last chapter, which is so, so interesting. I found it just fascinating. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to that very fascinating idea? Well, Paro, the first thing to say is, is that ever since I began writing, I have been terrified of one thing. I'm not frightened of dying, but I am frightened of dying when I'm at the very end of a book that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So I've often thought to myself, what would happen if, you know, I, I'm writing a, a book like Magpie Murders and I can't, and I die before the end. I, I, it's, a, it's a catastrophe because all that work is going to be for nothing. And all my life, this may sound weird, but it's absolutely true. I have left in my office a note on the shelf by my desk mm -hmm. with the ending of the book in it. So that if I do die before I get to the end, my, my assistant can, or my publisher or somebody can, can somehow finish the book. And it's oh. the thing I most fear. So that was the very beginning thought of Magpie Murders was just that, that sort of sense of fear that I've always had for real. Um, and I, I, at the same time, when I write murder mystery now, I think, again, this is something that goes back a long time. It takes me, like you, what, how long does it take you to write a book? About a year? For me, about Magpie Murders was a work of actually about two years of writing and 10 years of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, is it enough to write a book where the final chapter is simply the butler did it? Is it enough that, you know, clues, a murder and a solution? And I have been puzzling for years over the idea of, is it possible to use murder mystery and whodunit to do something different, do something that hasn't been done before? So to write books about murder mysteries that are themselves murder mysteries with devices like a missing chapter, to me makes me smile. Look at my Hawthorne series, the other set of books I'm writing. The word is murder, the sentence is death, and there'll be a new one next year. In these books, the author, me, 
is a character inside the book. So mm -hmm. the story here is a detective, Daniel Hawthorne, hires a writer to write about him simply for money. And, and I end up being that writer. And what it does is it takes the whodunit form and turns it on its head because normally Agatha Christie, Arthur Conan Doyle, Dorothy L. Sayers, whoever, you are in charge. You are on the mountain. You know everything which is happening in the book. Before you have written the first word, certainly this is true for me, you know who committed the murder. When you write a clue, you know you are writing a clue. Okay. But if you are the author inside the book, you know nothing. You are the most ignorant, the most stupid person, or at least I am the most ignorant and the most stupid person in the book. So what I'm doing here is taking the whodunit form and absolutely turning it upside down. And to me, that's a smile. So yes, you get the clues, the red herrings, the suspects, the, mm. the revelation, you get the fun of it, but I hope you get something more. And that's what I'm trying to do with these books. I mean, it, this was such a brilliant thing to have this fictionalized version of yourself. And immediately, as I read it, I had that moment saying, damn, why didn't I think of this? <laughs> well, it's funny, because when I, when I pitched the idea to, well, how it happened was that my publishers asked me to do a series of books. You know, they want to, because I think the publishers, as you know, do find it much easier, the Poirot series, the Home series, the, the Reba series, whatever it's going to be. And I began to think about, well, how can I do a series of books without, as I say, it just becoming formulaic. And then, in, a, in almost actually the same day, this idea fell in my head. But my publishers were quite nervous of it because was it going to be egotistical? Was it going to be all about me, me, me? You know, I'm mm. the best writer. Is it going to be that sort of, is it going to be promoting myself? And is it going to be settling scores with people that I don't like? And I had to think about it carefully but, and, and, and to persuade them that I would avoid the obvious traps, that the, the, the character who is me in the book, it's not about me, it's about the detective. Mm -hmm. I'm just Watson. The book is about Sherlock Holmes. And when you think about it, nobody knows very much about Dr. Watson. He's just the narrator. So that's how it works in the books. They're, they're not ego trips. They're not sort of banging my own drum. As I say, I'm the most stupid person in those books. And <laughs> I just follow Hawthorne around until he solves, you know, in the hope that he'll solve the crime. Because if he doesn't solve the crime, I won't have a book. I found him a very interesting character, fascinating character. And I, it left me wanting to know more about the, the fictionalized Anthony. Um, I well, didn't, it didn't come across to me as the most stupid in the book. I, I, well, my, my wife is watching very carefully. And she keeps saying, you're not putting the family in those books, Anthony. I'm not going to appear in it. She's made a couple <laughs> of brief appearances, but she, she's yes. standing there with a, with a there'll, be a, there'll be a murder in the Horowitz household if I write too much about her. <laughs> so talking about ego and also, uh, you know, do, did you, wasn't it intimidating to be writing um, for the estate of Arthur Conan Doyle and um, Agatha Christie writing Bond? Uh, was it intimidating? Um, I wouldn't say it's intimidating. It is challenging. I think when you start to write a James Bond novel or a Sherlock Holmes novel, the first thing you have to understand is that there are hundreds of thousands of very passionate fans of those books. Mm -hmm. And they're not fans of mine, they're fans of those books. Yeah. And my first thought is, I don't want to write a book that annoys them or disappoints them. Yeah. So that's the first challenge. It's got to be something that is true to the reasons why they love those books. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is that I have to acknowledge that Arthur Conan Doyle and Ian Fleming were both amazing writers. I mean, they are, great writers. They are bigger and better writers than me. So I have to raise my game to write half as well as them and to do better than that. I have to really think about how they write their books. My job is to be invisible in those books so that people don't say, see it as, as my work but as their work, which means adopting their literary oh. style, their tropes, their tricks. And, and all of that is challenging. When I was given the um, Sherlock Holmes book to write, uh, the House of Silk, as it became. Mm -hmm. I remember I didn't sign the contract until I'd written the first chapter. And I sent the chapter to the Doyle estate, to the agents, to the publishers. And I said, is this good enough? And they said, yes, it is. And then I wrote the book because I didn't want to let anybody down. That's a challenge. But it's not, what was the word you used? It was, um, I can't remember the word you used in your question. 
intimidating. It wasn't intimidating. I'm not easily intimidated. And, it's, and if I didn't believe I could do it, I don't think I'd have done it. I mean, I, I, I put this question to myself saying that, you know, if somebody said, write the next Harry Potter, I think I, I would be intimidated at first and I don't know how I would go about it because somewhere you, did you have, did you find in that process that you were having to suppress the natural Anthony Horowitz way and style and voice to adopt? I, not again, no, not, not suppress, adapt. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are tricks in these books that you learn right. that, that, that I'll give you an example in an in an Ian Fleming novel. He, he has two tricks. He often animates things. So uh, mm -hmm. a book will demand to be read or a, um, a, a, a pillow will embrace embrace your the side of your head uh, that they become animated. Mm -hmm. And so you do that in the storytelling. He'll jump in and out of, of James mm -hmm. Bond's head. So the camera, if you like, is going to go, it's up on the hill watching the car speeding down. Then it's, then it's right up close to Bond's face. Then it's in his head looking up and it's staccato. His, nobody writes action better than Ian Fleming. His action sequences are breathtakingly good, but his technique is one of staccato fast cuts. And, and so it would be the car sped down the hill, the wheel spat out, the, move faster, move faster, Bond says to himself, you know, get, get, avoid those bullets, get around that corner. So you're there, 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 and, and that's how you write it. So it's not a question about suppressing how I write, it's merely a question of adapting it to his way of doing it. Okay, interesting. I still don't know if I would be able to write the next Harry Potter, but- I don't think JK's are looking for anybody, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> uh, I read in an interview that you had wanted to write a James Bond film and it didn't, they didn't come to you, it didn't come to you. And so you invented a 14 year old James Bond by the name of Alex Ryder, uh, which is a beautiful name. Um, it's easy, the recall is so easy and yet it's very, uh, it, it, it's almost like an action figure kind of name, you know, Alex Ryder. Uh, so, but, but Bond, James Bond is such an adult kind of almost misogynistic character, uh, much as women swooned over him. Uh, so what did you keep in and what did you keep out for Alex Ryder? Um, Alex Ryder was definitely inspired by the Bond films. And I should mention incidentally that just yesterday he was released on television, an eight part version of Point Blank uh, was oh. released on Amazon June the 4th. And, um, and uh, has, I've just been working out this morning to be reading the reviews in the papers and all the remarks on social media. I didn't write the scripts, but um, it was a big day for Alex. And it was interesting that the comparisons between the TV were not with Bond, they were much more with Jason Bourne, which I think is a good result. Uh, it's what we wanted. Because for me, although the inspiration was Bond, and not just whether I wanted to write a film script, I loved Bond from the age of about 10 years old. I mean, I was 10 when Dr. No came out, the first Bond film, and then I read all the Bond novels and I loved them as a boy and um, uh, haven't, you know, then gone back to that world as a man. Um, although inspired by Bond is not similar to Bond. I think that yeah. that's what makes the books work. They're not Bond, you know, second class Bond spin-offs. Um, Alex doesn't want to be a spy. The most, that, that's his most important character note, is that actually he is not a patriot like Bond. He doesn't enjoy the work. He is twisted and forced into doing it. He is manipulated. And he really comes out of the books, you know, not altogether sort of happy with the world he's been, mm. been made to, to, to join. Um, and I deliberately made decisions to try and make it as different to Bond as I could. The only similarity was the gadgets which I put into the books, which interestingly they dropped from the TV series. But so many children that I spoke to said, where, where are the gadgets? We want gadgets. The writing in the books, it became impossible not to have gadgets. There are no budget, uh, gadgets in the, in the original James Bond books either. Ian Fleming didn't do gadgets. Um, that's a, a film thing. So I think that, that Alex is a modern teenager. And if the books work, it is because people, I think, relate to the character I don't think uh, the, 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 the fact that they have any similarities to Bond is particularly helpful to it. Hmm. Congratulations on uh, Alex coming on uh, television. 
I'm very happy. The TV series seems to have gone, 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 gone down very, very well. It is coming to India, so you can judge for yourself eventually. Oh, wonderful. Well, I can tell you my sister highly recommended Foil's War to me, and I'm enjoying it. I'm seeing it now from the beginning again. Um, it's a wonderful series, um, Foil's War. We well, were very kind to say it. It was 16 years of my life, and um, I'm very proud of the work we did on it. It's still being shown in England even now. There seems to barely a day when an episode isn't on television, and it wow. it has a huge following around the world. And I'm, you know, I'm very proud to have been, you know, the creator of it. Wonderful, Anthony. You lost your parents when you were quite young. Is that right? Uh, my father when I was 21 um, years old, and my mother when I was 32. Why do you think that a lot of characters, sort of in the genre of Alex Ryder, like Harry Potter, lose their parents, they're without parents? Well, Paro, the two questions I don't think are related in my case. I mean, you know, I was, look, the loss of my parents was sad, obviously, and, and you know, I, I, I miss in particular my mother to this day, but, but that isn't the reason why I did that in the Alex Ryder books. I think in many, many, classic children's adventures, mm -hmm. you lose the parents in order to enable the child. As I say, when I visit schools, it is impossible to have fun or to have adventures when your parents are around. You've got to get rid of them. And in the books, I kill them because that's the easiest way to do it. But Roald Dahl, of course, did this. You know, one thinks of, you know, the parents who I think in one book are killed by a rhinoceros in the opening chapter. So, but the death is not a traumatic death. It's a death with a smile. And it's not even a death that is serious. I think when you, you know, one of the things that's actually quite interesting about the Alex Ryder books is, is that in the very early books, it's just accepted that he's, his parents aren't there. It's only in the later books, as he gets slightly deeper as a character, and I begin to think about him more, that he himself begins to, to dwell on the fact that he is an orphan, that he has never had yeah. a family, and it begins to mean something to him. And that's an interesting transition, because originally it was just an excuse. You know, if, if you've got parents, they're not going to let you be a spy. Let you, let, let you do that. The Scorpio Rising was supposed to have been the last Alex Ryder book. That is right. And then after a gap of some years, you came back to revisit him. So how long was that gap and, and why did you feel that, he, that there was more to say? I, I was always nervous. And I, I, as a writer, this is my, it's something that still makes me nervous of becoming formulaic. I don't want to write books simply because I know they'll sell and because, the, you know, because people like the character. I don't want to write books because I'm going to get a check at the end of the month into my bank account. I write because I love writing and I want to surprise myself and I want to keep developing. I always say, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, that, that writing is a journey. Writing is an exploration. It is an adventure in itself. And you should keep surprising yourself and keep stretching yourself. So that was why I decided to stop writing Alex. And Scorpio Rising was meant to be the end of it all. But then two things happened. The first was that I realized that I had done a disservice to my readers because Scorpio Rising is quite a sad book. And Alex finishes the book in a sad place. And I think oh, yeah. that I believe myself that children's writers have very few responsibilities. We can write what we want, want to write. We don't need to be politically correct. We don't need to have to do what we're told to do. Mm. But I do think we have one responsibility. Mm. And that is it's to be positive, to be optimistic, to leave children with the belief that the world is going to be a better place and that it is their world. Because of course it is. We're old, it's their world. So I felt I'd done them a disservice. At the same time, my publishers wanted to put out a collection of short stories, which eventually became a book called Secret Weapon. And mm -hmm. I went over some old stories and then I began to rewrite them because they weren't good enough. And then I thought they weren't enough. So I thought I'd better write a couple more. And in doing that, I realized actually I'd missed Alex and that there was still plenty to write about and that they were fun to write, and that I wasn't trapped, and they weren't going to be predictable. The story I wrote that really persuaded me was Alex in Afghanistan, which has an action sequence, which still makes me smile at the end of that story, the way he escapes from the mountain citadel. Um, I won't spoil it, it's, it's, it's just a fun idea. And then suddenly I was back writing Alex again, and so Never Say Die came out. Even that mm -hmm. title, incidentally, is trying to cheer you up. Scorpio Rising yeah. is down, Never Say Die. Let's get on with it. And then recently Nightshade came out, um, just uh, in April, sadly, in a rather sort of strange world with no book launch mm -hmm. and no party and no signings and nothing. Mm -hmm. But it's, I think, the best of all the Alex's. I think I'm so glad I wrote it because, again, 
the action in it is so, the, ch the last chapter, I was talking to my wife about it this morning, it is such a film. You know, she's got, we've got to put it on the screen one day because it's a James Bond stunt to outdo anything you've oh. ever seen in Bond. Oh, <laughs> I look And researching it, researching it was enormous it. fun. Uh, coming mm. up with it and then researching it and making it work. Wow. So the, I'm just going back to something that you said a little while ago, which was death with a smile. And you've, you've said two in, very intriguing things that have stayed with me. One is... Um, violence with a smile, and the other is that writing and reading are telepathy. Uh, uh, so, I mean... Writing uh, and reading, sorry, I missed that last word. Writing and reading are... Telepathy. Okay, yes, yes. Well, they're two separate things. I mean, let's talk about violence first. I'm looking at the images from America, the casual violence that the police are putting onto actually everybody now, not just black people, but white people too. And it shocks me, it disgusts me, it's horrific. It, it's, uh, there is nothing funny about violence ever. So when you talk about violence with a smile, what do you mean? I think you're talking about taking something out of violence or putting it into a context that somehow neutralizes it. Um, at the end of Eagle Strike, the main villain, Damien Cray, is pushed out of a plane and sucked into the engine of the plane and minced up. Now, if I filmed that on the screen or if you saw it happen, it would, could be quite disgusting and sick making and horrible. But when you realize that in that chapter, Damien Trey is pushed out of the plane on a tea trolley, there's something about, there you go, you're laughing, you're smiling. There's something about it that neutralizes the reality of that violence. Added to which, because it's in a fantastical book, which you know is a sort of a children's book or a young adult book, which is not really the real world, you can, you can enjoy it. So, when I write violence, I'm always looking to somehow neutralize it, to take something out of it. And it's what I began by saying about murder in real life versus murder in books. Violence in my books should never be upsetting. Violence in real life always is. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. In terms of the other comments you made about telepathy, it is, it's simple. I've always had the belief that, that reading, and one of the reasons why reading is so valuable to young people, is one of the most creative things you can do. It is not a leisure activity. It is actually an activity that demands enormous creative prowess. So when you read a book, you are taking all these digits and your brain is putting them together into words and the words into sentences. You're making sense of those sentences and of the paragraphs and you're remembering as you go along. So already there's a certain amount of mental activity. But on top of that, you've now got to visualize everything. So when I describe Alex, you see him. You see the city where he lives. You see the other people around him. You are building a world. And I believe there is something about that, which is a sort of a telepathy going on between the writer and the reader, a sort of a, a communal link between us. You, you see what I'm asking you to see and you build on it. And it's a wonderful relationship. Oh. And, and, uh, and I, I have called it telepathy, yes. I'm going to use that, Anthony. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, so let, let's hear some from Magpie Murders. I have to tell you, I'm about halfway through Moonflower Murders. Um, but I would love to hear from Magpie Murders as well. It's a wonderful book. We were very kind. Of, I wasn't quite sure which what what section to read from you because I I'm not actually that good at reading uh, from my own books. Um, and I'm thumbing through because I suddenly realised I was going to read a section. Um, where let me see what I could do. Hold a second. It was a little chapter here. Can you talk amongst yourselves while I try and find the section <laughs> I want to read? Yeah, well, um, you are, um, I, um, I can share with you one while Anthony finds the uh, exact spot that he wants to read from. I can share with you, he was a big Tintin fan and such a big fan that he actually has a secret passageway in his office, is that right? That is absolutely true. <laughs> anyway, here's a section, here is a section. Um, this okay. is a chapter, I'm just gonna read it, it's about a page and a half, not very much. Uh, it's called, He Used to Hide Things. And it's talking about um, Alan Conway, the author of the book inside the book, who used to hide things inside his book for his own amusement. And it also illustrates, I hope, the idea of using a whodunit to discuss things that are about books and literature. Mm. James was right about anagrams and the rest of it. In Gin and Sinai, which is set in London, there are characters called Leighton Jones, Victoria Wilson, Michael Latimer, 
Brent Andrews and Warwick Stevens. All these names are taken partly from tube stations. The two killers, Linda Cole and Matilda Orr, are both anagrams of Collindale on the Northern Line and Latimer Road. The gay writers make up a cast of red roses with Atticus. In Atticus Punt takes the case, well, you can work it out for yourself. John Waterman, Khan Bowles Advertising, Caroline Fisher, Carla Visconti. They're all fountain pens. I woke up the next morning just after seven o'clock with a headache and a nasty taste in my mouth. Bizarrely, James's car keys were still clutched in my hand and for a ghastly moment, I half expected to open my eyes and find him lying next to me. I went into the bathroom and had a long hot shower. Then I dressed and went downstairs to black coffee and grapefruit juice. I had the manuscript of Magpie Murders with me and despite, despite my state, it didn't take me long to find out what I was looking for. All the characters are named after birds. When I'd read the book for the first time, I'd made a note to tackle Alan about some Magnus Pie and Pie Hall. The names had struck me as a little childish, old fashioned at the very least. They felt like something out of Tintin. Going through it again, I realized that almost everyone, even the most minor characters, have been given the same treatment. There are obvious ones. The vicar is Robin and his wife is Hen. Whitehead is an antique dealer, Red Wing a doctor, and Weaver an undertaker. They're all fairly common species, as are Crane and Lanner, the estate agents in Bath, and Kite, the landlord of the ferryman. Some are a little more difficult to pin down. Joyce Sanderling is named after a small wading bird and Jack Dartford after a warbler. Brent, the groundsman, is a type of goose and his middle name is Jay. A 19th century naturalist called Thomas Blakiston had an owl named after him and so on. Does it matter? Well, yes, actually, it worries me. Character names are important. I've known writers who've used their friends while others have turned to reference books. The Oxford Book of Quotations and the Cambridge Biographical Encyclopedia are two. I've heard mentioned. What's the secret of a good name in fiction? Simplicity is often the key. Harry Potter didn't get to be who he was by having too many syllables. That said, the name is often the first thing you learn about a character, and I think it helps if it fits comfortably, and so on and so on. That's enough reading. But what I'm illustrating here is that this is a book, Mrs. Magpie Murders, and Moonflower Murders, of course, which is the sequel coming out in August, are books that both give you a murder mystery and give you some discussion about murder mystery. The main character, Susan Ryland, is an editor after all, so she knows books inside out. And I love the fact that you could both solve the crime and have a think about how crimes in books are constructed. Yeah. So did you know when you were writing Magpie Murders when you started that there was going to be a sequel? No, quite the opposite. I always assumed there would only be one in them. And what ah. happened was, was that my publisher, again, the book was, of course, very successful. It's probably been my most successful book, Magpie Murders. Mm. And my publisher said, look, we would really love another one, particularly as because the main character is a woman, which yeah. a lot, I'm not, I don't often write women as main characters. I, I find it, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but I find it more, it stretches me more. Let us put it that way. But Susan is a good character and, and a strong character and not a classic detective. I think she's an editor. So I was very happy to return to her. And then it occurred to me that I could actually do a second book, that there was a second one lurking in there. And so Moonflower Murders came, came to mind, even though I should say that it works in a very different way to Magpie Murders. There's no unfinished book this time. There is a book within a book. There is a book written by Alan Conway set in 1955, which is a murder mystery. And it does have within it a secret, which is something to do with the present day. But it does it. But it's but it works in a, it's a it's a completely different approach to the same idea. So I'm very happy with it. And it's uh, it's you know those people who've read it so far have been very positive. So that's yeah. good. Uh, one last question, and then we'll I think open up uh, to people who want to ask questions. Uh, what's next from the devious mind of Anthony Horowitz? Uh, I think I've mentioned it already that I'm going to do another Hawthorne novel next year. So there's a third one, which I, I've just begun to think about. Of, this, of these ones? That's the, that's the Hawthorne Horowitz. It's where I'm the character in the book, like Daniel Hawthorne is detective. There are going to be 10 of them in total, 10 or even maybe 12. So number wow. three is the next big book I'm going to, to do. Um, I'm, as I said, writing the Diamond Brothers book, that's uh, Where Seagulls Dare. Uh, do look it out, anthonyhorowitz.com. And, um, and I need to finish that. And I'm writing... That's what I you probably see when I'm wearing this shirt. This is um, Quibi. I'm writing uh, Quibi is a wonderful um, uh, oh. and very interesting American TV um, platform, except it's not for televisions, it's for mobile phones. And I've written a murder mystery for them. So, um, oh, wow. that's, uh, so I'm working on that. Wonderful. 
So I think, um, Raghu, shall we open up? I, I can see there are quite a few questions lined up already. Yeah, uh, yeah no, such a delightful conversation, uh, Anthony Farrow. And uh, there's a whole bunch of questions that have come up. Uh, maybe what we'll do is um, uh, give folks a chance to actually ask the question rather than one of us reading out. Uh, so yeah. I'll start with uh, Arun Raman. Uh, Arun, if you could uh, go ahead and ask your question, please. Okay. Am I audible? You are. Yes. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, may I first of all say that I consider the House of Silk the finest home pastiche along with uh, Nicholas Mayer's The 7% Solution. So, oh, Aaron, that's, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And may I say also that I love The 7% Solution. I think it's an absolutely wonderful book. So I share your, share your enthusiasm. And I'm very happy to be, to be linked in with that title. Yes, absolutely. And my question is really about the, uh, the adventure slash thriller as a genre, then a whodunit. And uh, in writing them myself, I've written a, a, a three books. The focus, the four elements that I find very important in this particular genre are obviously the plot, the pace, the, the characters themselves, and the backdrop. So when you sit down to craft a novel of adventure, how do you go about constructing these four elements or any other elements that you deem important? And how does it all happen? And from start to beginning, can you give us a kind of rough sense of how you go about it? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's my method, and I'm not saying this is the method that everybody should use, is always to begin with the structure. Um, I, I begin with the core idea of what the book is going to be about, which I think of as the center of the dartboard. And then I draw the circles around it, if you like. If it's a murder mystery, it's somebody kills somebody else. And then it's uh, the people who they're connected with. So I start at the very core of the book. That's the heart of it. Now, that core may only be revealed in the last chapter. In the House of Silk, obviously, the crime that the House of Silk represents was where I began that book. That was what the book was going to be about. And then from that, it's a spiraling outwards. And I am very, very careful to construct everything. In the list of the four um, uh, ingredients you mentioned at the beginning of your question, character is obviously the most important one. So again, if it's a murder mystery or, or a thriller, whatever, somebody has killed somebody else. Who is that person? What has motivated the killing? Why have they been drawn to do this? Why couldn't they have talked to whoever they killed and, and just come to a happier conclusion? Um, why, why are they so angry? Who are they? Then you ask, who are they married to? Who are their children? Who are their friends? What is their world? So it, it's always a, a blossoming outwards they think. I cannot write a book without doing that work, which may take me longer than the book itself, than the writing of the book. But to me, the structure, the road plan of the book is where I begin uh, and everything else fits into that. You know, in terms of instead the action and adventure, you know, if I'm writing a James Bond novel, I've got the, the beginning, I've got that core idea that he's going to stop somebody from blowing up a, 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 a rocket in New York, which is the plot sort of of, um, of Trigger Mortis. Uh, but then I might not know what the action is going to be. Bond is captured in chapter seven and is threatened with something nasty. It's only when I get to chapter seven that I decide how he's captured and what that nastiness is going to be. And that becomes a separate thing. I always say that if you're planning a book, leave room to surprise yourself. If you can't surprise yourself, you won't surprise your readers. Mm. Right. Thank you for your uh, question. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, very, very useful. Up next, um, we have a question from Shrabanti. I'll have her go next. Hello. 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 Hello, Shrabanti, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Anthony. I just hi, uh, wanted to say... Hi, uh, just wanted to say I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, the word is murder series as well as magpie murders, especially really loved magpie murders because of the book within a book kind of thing. Like it's probably my favorite literary genre. I mean, mm -hmm. and especially if it has a mystery in it. Um, I wanted to ask you something and, and uh, actually, uh, you know, both these books, 
I mean, both these series have a slightly cozy murder mystery feel to them. I mean, of course, there is a troubled detective at the heart of the word is murder series, but uh, you know, it feels so good to read something like that. Much as I like my P.D. James and Tana Frenches, uh, you know, sometimes uh, procedurals just don't have that same feel. Do you think the days of the cozy murder mystery are over? I mean, and and why is like why uh, is the world overrun by police uh, procedurals and you know detectives with a troubled past? Um. Well, thank you for your, first, for your earlier remarks, ha, 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 which were very kind. No, I've, of course I don't think they're over. I mean, what we call the golden age of detective fiction, Agatha Christie, who is still a huge, um, you know, uh, selling novel, and, and P.D. James to a certain extent, and, you know, Nagayo Marsh, all the great names of, the, of those things. I like writing that type of fiction because I think that crime fiction is really interesting if it's cerebral, if, if you, if you mm. the reader, and the detective are in the same place and it isn't a, an expert coming in with a spectroscope or some kind of fingerprint evidence or anything of that sort to solve the crime. I love the idea that you are on an equal footing. I am with Hawthorne um, and, and that he sees things that I don't, but it, he doesn't actually get any extra help. Uh, from from outside. So, and I also incidentally like the sort of you know we've talked. Uh, I was talking earlier about about violence and and about um uh, you know about the world the brutality of the world we live in. I quite like the fact that my books are a little gentler than that. That they are, if you like, an oasis from that. You know, I read books that are. Uh, here's a book I'm reading at the moment. I recommend it thoroughly. By the way, the Don Winslow trilogy. Um, uh, the, the first one is called The Power of the Dog. The second one is called um, the, um, oh God, the Cartel. And this one is called The Border. It's an absolutely, these books are in, unbelievably violent and shocking and awful. And I admire them very much. And there are lots of books like this that are do, not as good as this, but there are many books in this genre. But I like a slightly gentler world. I am not that sort of person that really wants to, you know, in my books, I don't like having too much description of violence and, and un unpleasantness, as I was saying earlier when I was talking with Harrow. So, so I no, I don't think it's dead. I think there's a very, very good place for it. There's room for everybody, of course. That's the joy of reading. But, um, but, but my little niche is a slightly sort of quieter one. Thank you so much, and thank you for thank you for your question and for your kind mark. Thank you. Thanks, Ravanti. Up next, uh, Timia, go ahead with your question. Hi, Anthony. Hi, uh, Timmy. Lovely to be talking is... to you. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm uh, great, thanks. Good. So my question was also originally about your planning process. Both Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders have parallel storylines running alongside, but one way or another, they are also connected. Was it challenging to, to, to set up the whole planning, and uh, did you plan, plan it all out, or... Sorry, or uh, did you make it up as you went along? And also, um, first, Atticus Pond or the Susan Ryland part? One of the greatest pleasures of writing books for me, these sorts of books, is coming up with plots that are to my mind. And I hope I'm not being too boastful here, because I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet, but, but which are like watches, the, the mechanism of the novel every cog, every wheel, every, every spring, every screw has been carefully thought out so that everything fits together in a particular way. So the books are, on the one hand, massively complicated. And if you opened up your watch, you would find, you probably would find it very hard to sort of work out how it's all put together. But that the result is actually very simple. You can glance at your watch, you know what the time is. And I think that's how the books are meant to work. But the mechanism is complicated. The reading is pleasurable and simple. And um, so I, I, I suppose that answer, I hope that answers your question, because to me, that the, the pleasure of the book is the complexity of it. And I, I always want one of my books to be guessable. If somebody tells me they guess the ending, although part of me is really annoyed, oh my God. And the other, there's a little voice that actually says, no, that's how it should be. It should be possible to guess. Agatha Christie's genius is that actually every single one of her books plays fair with the reader. Um, there is, she never wrote a book that, um, that, that, that didn't do that. Conan Doyle, on the other hand, regularly has um, Sherlock Holmes leave the page and go off somewhere and come back with the vital information that allows him to solve the clue. So the reader and poor Dr. Watson never had a chance. And although I do love the Holmes novels, that does quite annoy me. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, because I'm getting silence. <laughs> Maybe because she was on mute. Thanks, Anthony. We'll, we'll jump. <laughs> no, so I wasn't about with that. Um, I've answered the question. I, I, I know Tamia. We we communicate on Twitter regularly, so it's lovely ah, to talk to her too. Got it. Uh, there's a question from Sneha Ganesh. Uh, if she's uh, still in the room, actually, I see she she is in the room. Uh, we'll go next with uh, Aruna Kumar. Aruna, go ahead and ask your question, please. Sorry, maybe you're still on mute. Can you yeah, there you go. Still on mute. Now, Aruna, go ahead. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, all my students are fan of yours. So I just want to hear from you certain tips where some of them are really good writers. So some tips for your for your for your pupils. Well, first of all, Aruna, thank you for supporting my work in your classroom. Um, uh, I I can't speak for India, but certainly in India, certainly in England uh, and Britain, teachers have done a fantastic job of trying to keep children um, motivated and educated during these very. Um, awful times for them. So, so uh, first of all, a thank you to you for that. Tips for young writers. Um, I've talked about some of them in this, in this, um, in this uh, session, but I, I, I will say these. One, read. The more you read, the better you write. Two, plan your work. I think it's much easier, even if you only spend a minute thinking about what you're going to write, you'll find it easier to write if you've just jotted down half a dozen words on the page to, um, to uh, guide you. Three, enjoy your writing. If you're not enjoying it, if you don't have a buzz when you sit down with your pencil or your pen or whatever it is, your, or your keyboard, you, something has gone wrong. Enjoy it or something has gone wrong. But the most important thing of all, I think, is to believe in yourself. You know, when you're writing, when I'm writing, I know when I'm writing well. And if somebody tells me that it's not good, it work, you know, I listen to advice, but at the same time, it's what I believe that matters. And I think this is true for young people in anything they want to do in life. But self-belief is so critical. I grew up as a, as, a, as, a, as a student who was bottom of the class. My teachers thought I was a waste of space. Even my father thought I was, was, you know, was not a clever boy. And yet always, always I believed in myself. And here I am now, you know, selling all these books and, 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 and having the success I've had. Self-belief. That's what every writer needs. So that's just four little tips, which I hope will help you and your students. I, I'd like to add one more tip, which is very per pertinent to this session, because it's a secret formula that I follow called BIC. BIC, which doesn't in this case stand for Bangalore International Center, but rather for bottom in chair. Put your bottom into a chair and write. You just heard Anthony saying he writes for 10 hours a day. Um, I also try and write at least two hours, a minimum of two hours every day, no matter what. And if I can get more in there, great, but I don't always manage to, but at least two hours every single day. So BIC, put your bottom in a chair and start to write. Yes, that's great advice. <laughs> Lubaina, I think is next. Yeah, uh, let's hear from uh, Lubena. Hi, how are you? How exciting to see Anthony and Paro. Hi. So lovely. <laughs> I have a question, Anthony. Uh, what is, uh, you know, what is your favorite literary device to create tension and um, suspense in a novel? Um. I think Do you the, the reader, Alfred, you, you know? Oh, Alfred Hitchcock, I think, explained this best. If two people are sitting at a table having a conversation, there is no suspense. But if two people are sitting at a table having a conversation and you, the reader or the viewer, know that there is a time bomb underneath the table, you have suspense. So my favorite device is to give the reader information that the character does not have. So the reader is saying, oh my God, something bad is gonna happen and the character is unaware of it. I mean, another example I give of this, a literary device, is that in a horror film, the most scary moment is when the hand reaches for the door, the heroine or the hero's hand reaches to open the door. And the scary bit is not the knife going into them, it is the knowledge there is something on the other side of the door that is gonna hurt, that there is some monster on the other side of the door, but they are in danger. 
So I think that for me, the most fun I have is creating that awareness, that sense, that knowledge of something bad is going to happen. You, the reader, know it, but the character maybe doesn't. Very interesting. I love that. It's and a difficult one to answer because a lot of my work is instinctive, but it's something on those lines. Great, thanks. Next question. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Abhay Karant. Uh, Abhay, if you can ask your question, please. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. You are, Abhay. How lovely to be talking to you. Yeah, I'm a 13-year-old and I love... Um, your Alex Ryder books and The Power of Five. Well, and, thank you very much. That's good. And my question was, um, in Power of Five, where did you get the idea to write that series? Like, it's a magical fantasy kind of book series, well, right? So where did you get the idea? Well, Abai, thank you very much indeed for contacting me. And thank you especially for... Um, mentioning a series which is less well known than the Alex Ryder books. And I always say it's a very special reader who knows those books and likes them. So you're, I'm very grateful to you for mentioning them to me uh, in this talk. The, the, the books are, as you say, they're sort of more in those world of sorcery and, and, and magic and, and the paranormal, five children from all over the world joining forces to defeat the power of evil. And the inspiration for those books was a, a thought I had a long time ago. I love books like The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, uh, the Narnia books by C.S. Lewis. I like, I like um, all books set in fantasy worlds. Um, but the thought I had was, would it be possible to write one of those books with devils and demons and magic and witches and all those sorts of things and do them in the real world? Because isn't it a wonderful thought that maybe in the streets of wherever you are, whichever city you happen to find yourself in, um, things are happening that you are unaware of fights are taking place, wizardry is happening, that what looks like an ordinary shop or a restaurant or a, or, or a temple or whatever it is, is actually not what it seems to be. But just out of the corner of your eye, round the corner of the street, there are fantastical events happening. So that was the inspiration for the Power of Five series, that these five children are, or five young adults, so they're 16 or 15, I forget their age, are, are engaged in a struggle which is happening in the real world, but only they are aware of it. And, and it was also sort of, it, the books mattered to me because I wanted to write a book about the way I saw the world going, the sort of fight between good and evil. And I've talked a little bit about America. And when I look at America now, it's almost the world of the power of five. It's sort of, you know, you wouldn't have thought that such things could really happen, but now there they are out on the streets in front of your eyes taking place. So that was the inspiration. And I'm absolutely overjoyed that you have liked those books. They, they're very important to me. Anthony, when yeah. you started out, when you started out, you couldn't have imagined that all over the world, there would be children and adults who were so familiar and fond of your work. Well, you know, see, one of the few things about getting older, uh, and that, which I am doing very rapidly, is that I meet these young adults now who are 30, 31, 32, some of them have children, and they read me when they were 10 years old. And, mm. and, and my work has been a part of their life for 20 years or more. And I, I find that very encouraging and reassuring. I think that, you know, when, when you look at life and, and our place in life, all you can really hope for is to try and make a, a small difference for good. You know, and I think that's what's great about being a writer. But at the end of the day, whatever people say about my work, I don't think it's harmed anybody. I've just done little bits of good. And like talking to that young boy just now who loves my work and the fact that he's, you know, on the other side of the world and I'm here and we're talking on this screen, it just makes me feel good about humanity and about the way that, that yeah. reading and books and literacy not only bring us together, but bring out the best in us. And that matters to me. I think that's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. I think uh, all of us at the festival agree completely on that. Uh, let's go to Advaita Shamsundar. Advaita, if you could ask your question. Um, Hello? Advaita, are you there? Yeah. Oh. Doesn't look like it. All right. Uh, we have another question from uh, Jane. Jane, if you're uh, still there. Uh, hi, Paro. Hi. Hey, uh, Jane. How are you? Hi, Jane. Yeah, hi, Anthony. Uh, my question to you is um, you write in different, uh, you write different characters, different voices, right? From uh, one of, I mean, from 
uh, Detective Inspector Barnaby, right, to Alex Ryder, to the Diamond Brothers. How do you change your protagonist's voice when you're writing across different series? And uh, does the idea or the plot suggest which crime solver will solve which of these crimes? Two great questions, Jane. Are you a writer yourself? I am, yes. I had a feeling I, you must be. Anthony, I, had a feeling. I, must, I, I just want to jump in here to say that Jane has a fabulous book called The Flyaway Boy, which is one of my absolute favorites about not fitting in. Thank Wonderful, you. I love the title already. Um, I should look out for it. I should look out for it on a, 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 a big out. Well, Jane, lovely to talk to you. Thank you for joining in my session. Um, the question you asked, um, the different characters, um, their voices. It's a very, very interesting question. When I write myself, uh, I often find myself, once I've created a character and know the character, I feel almost like I'm the secretary in the room, jotting down what they say I hear them saying it and I write it down as fast as I can before I forget what they have said and I can hear how they say it. Because of course, all of us have different ways of speaking and different different mannerisms uh, in our speech. And, and obviously if I'm writing Sherlock Holmes, for example, he speaks in a way that has a certain 19th century inflection, uh, you know, a, a propriety, a sort of a, a formality of language. Um, you know, he, he, you, you hear his voice. So I think that's the first part of your question is that I know the characters, therefore I hear them speak. And actually, if the dialogue is not coming easily, it means I don't know my characters well enough. They speak to me. Uh, the second part of your question, which is a really interesting question, I think I've ever been asked it, which is how do I know which plot goes with which character? I guess it's sort of, I think I open a box. Like at the moment, I am having to think of a third Hawthorne novel. And I know I have this rather acerbic detective and not a very nice man. And I know I have this rather foolish narrator who's going to follow him around trying to work it out for himself. And therefore I'm searching for a plot that works in that box, in that environment. So it isn't a case of a story falls into my head. Um, you know, a, a, a butterfly collector is killed in his tower. Is that a Hawthorne story? Is it a, is it a Magpie Murders story? Is it a, you know, is it an Alex Ryder story? It's I begin by defining the world in which I'm in when I start thinking and the idea arrives fitted to that character. Does that answer your question, Jane? It does, thank you. Good, 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 good. Excellent. I should look out for um, your book. Up next, uh, Akshara Mahesh, I see you have a few questions, so go for it. Hi, I would just like to say I'm 14 years old and I'm a fan of your Diamond Brothers series. Um, so does the wit come naturally to you or do you add it in the middle? Does what come naturally to me, I'm sorry? The wit in your books. Oh, the wit, the, the wit. Um, the jokes just fall out of the sky. Have you, have you read any of The Seagull Has Landed? No, not really, I haven't tried well, do it. Look, do look out for it, as I say, it's on anthonyhorowitz.com, it's completely free and there are five chapters out there. And I think it's got some really good jokes in it. Um, the jokes, Again, jokes a little bit like Jane's question about the voices of the characters. When you start with Tim Diamond, who is so stupid, and Nick Diamond, who is so smart, and these really bizarre murder mysteries that they find themselves solving, I sort of, I'm inside the world. I'm not, I'm not sitting here thinking, what's funny? What's gonna be a good joke? I just think like Tim does, and the jokes just fall onto the page. And as I said at the very beginning of this talk, you know, it's, it's been a surprise to me, but the, the books have been so easy, this new one has been so easy to write, given that the world is so difficult. But maybe the answer to that is because I'm inside the book and I'm with Tim, so the jokes are just there. I don't sit down and work them out like a maths problem, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining in. All right, we're down to the last set of questions. These are um, from YouTube, so I'll just read them out uh, for uh, okay. and Paro. Uh, there's a question from Vani Mahesh. Uh, I've read all your uh, young adult books and love them. Uh, a few questions. Uh, what do you enjoy more, writing for kids or for adults? So that's the first one. The second, if I am to read your adult novels, what do you suggest I start with? And uh, the third one, which is uh, your books for children are incredibly witty. Does the wit grow or do you deliberately put the wit bits in? 
Well, I think the third question I just answered last time, the moment ago, right. in terms of which do I like best? I mean, I like all my writing. I am. I love writing. I, one thing has not changed in the 35 years I've been writing, and that is that I love writing passionately, and I love them all equally. So I, I can't answer that one I like more than the other because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just very, very happy in what I do. But I will say this, I think that probably my children's writing, my writing for young adults is the writing I most value because I have this great belief in the power of literacy and of reading and of using your imagination and of reading fiction. And that having met, as I've said, young people who have now grown up and who seem to be having a happy life and to know that I have been a part of that life is, is something that, you know, I will take with me and, which, and that matters to me. So I think that the, the, the children's writing is what I most value. And if I, if I was forced only to do one, that is what I would do. But, I, but I'm very happy writing uh, the adult books. And since you asked which adult book to start with, that's a difficult one. I'd suggest either The House of Silk, because I think that is a, is a, is a fun book and it's, it's, it's um, a, a book that's done well. Um, or maybe The Word is Murder, which is one of the first in the Hawthorne books, because they're light and you mentioned in your last question about wit, and there's lots of wit in that book. So I, I'd go maybe the, 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 if you want a modern book, uh, The Word is Murder. If you want to go into the 19th century and into sort of, you know, uh, pastiche, go for hopes. And uh, the last question for today, this uh, I think is an easy one. Uh, I'd like to, uh, this is from Vijay Lakshmi Nagaraj. I'd like to ask Anthony, how does he decide on the names for the titles of his books? Names and titles do sometimes take me a long time to get right. Um, if it's an Alex Ryder book, don't forget that a title is two or three words long and a lot depends on it. You know, um, if I'd called Stormbreaker, you know, the, 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 the computer mystery, I don't think it would have done quite so well. Stormbreaker automatically gets you smiling. And that came to me simply because I needed a name for a computer. And so I thought computers work on electricity, electrical storms, computers break codes, don't they? Because that's what they do, code breaking, storm breaker. So that was how that came about. Skeleton Key, the third Alex Ryder book, came about because it was set on an island. And I thought, well, an island is a key. And I thought, well, skeleton key, everyone knows what that is, is a thing that burglars use. And skeletons suggest death. So that's one of my favorite titles. But, but sometimes it takes me a very long time. I'll tell you the title of a story I've just written. I've just written a new uh, Atticus Punt story. Um, it's just a little extra for a publisher. And nobody knows this. I haven't, haven't told anybody this. And you can tell me, oh no, don't tell me. You can, I'll find out, my publisher will tell me if this is a good title or a bad title. It's a, it's a murder mystery that takes place at a dinner party. It's a short story that goes to the back of um, Moonflower Murders in some editions. And the title I came up with, which I sort of like, was Seven for Dinner, Six for Dessert. Ooh. Yeah, I'm getting a laugh, a smile. I'm getting two laughs and two smiles. And that just made me smile. And that's what a good title should do. So there you go. <laughs> Can I just say before we stop this, how, what a delight, Paro, as always, talking to you is just a joy and a pleasure. And I wish you all happiness and health and success. And to everybody who's been listening to this as well, you know, may you come through these difficult times with your health and with your and, and with your you know your your well-being intact. And to the organizers, once again, it is a fantastic thing you've done today, for me anyway, to, to allow me to connect with my readers and with Paro. And I just want to say thank you to all of you really from the bottom of my heart. Uh, the, the feeling is absolutely mutual, Anthony, and of course, Paro as well. Thank you so much for uh, doing this and for being part of uh, you know, the inaugural edition of, uh, of our World Lit uh, series. So the, the launch really uh, couldn't have asked for uh, someone, uh, couldn't have asked for anyone better than, than the two of you. So on, uh, on behalf of uh, Shiny, Ravi, uh, Raghu and myself, and of course, the entire uh, BIC team, uh, the Bangal Literature Festival team, and of course, all of the audience that was there, particularly the young folks that actually joined us today. A big thank you to both of you. And uh, we'll do more of this and hope to uh, see you uh, hopefully in person uh, soon, either in India or in some other part of the world. Uh, on that note, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you I'm very much. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony Paro. <laughs>